Hey there, and welcome back to the Insights of Net Support podcast, Corporate Edition. I'm your host, Kat Couchy, and today I'm really excited to be welcoming Tommy onto the show. Welcome, Tommy. It's lovely to see you. Hey, Kat. How are you? Thank you very much for having me. Oh, of course. No, I'm, I'm good, thank you. How about you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. Good. How's your week been so far? It's been good. It's been busy. Um, mm-hmm. The weather has been atrocious. Uh, yeah. It's been <laughs> raining all week. But um, aside from that, it, it's been very busy, you know. So, yeah, yeah. can't stop Brilliant. So, would you mind just by starting um, introducing yourself to our listeners, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so, my name is Tommy Hatto. Uh, I am probably, as a, my friends would describe me, I'm a jack of all trades. Um, so I am a founder of a company called THO. Uh, we are a brand and culture agency. Um, we specialize in bringing together brand and culture and all of the elements of well-being, mental health uh, within that for corporate organizations. Uh, I also have past lives as an actor and a model. Um, and uh, yeah, that's kind of me. Brilliant. For a minute, when you said past lives, I thought you meant like reincarnations, and I was like, "Oh, <laughs> I remember all these reincarnations." Maybe I don't, I don't know. It's uh, so I, I'm kind of. It's funny. I am. My mom is a Buddhist, and uh, mm-hmm. I do believe in Buddhism as well. Um, so we believe in reincarnation. So mm-hmm. who knows? I may you have had know. many past lives. Yeah. No, that's really interesting, though. And do you think it was kind of your background in areas like modeling and acting that got you? really interested in kind of men's health and body image initially yeah i think navigating that journey and um kind of living in hollywood and living and traveling all over the world and being in that space Mm. really i already had body image issues growing up as a kid before i went into that industry but Mm. i think going into that really brought out my own insecurities and actually i started noticing those insecurities in other people as well and Mm. you know kind of when COVID hit taking that time to reflect when I was just at home we were all at home with our own thoughts and thinking what can I do you know with my platform Mm. to tell this message and tell my story and what I've been through and have people resonate with that and you know people stand up and say I feel exactly the same way you know I've been I've been telling stories all of my life you know when you're a kid and you know you're putting on shows and plays for your parents and things and you want them to watch and then kind of you know transitioning into being able to do that as a profession and tell stories through movies and but now I get to do it in a different way where I'm telling my own authentic story and actually people are responding to that the same way you would to watch a movie you know it's impacting you and you're feeling something right at your chest Mm. affects you personally so for me that's the greatest motivator is to help people Mm. yeah absolutely that's really interesting and like you say if you saw other people that were around you were feeling the same way it's wonderful that you wanted to make that impact yeah i think you know i we we almost look at the industry with rose tinted glasses and mm. for everyone, what it's worth it is a very fancy lifestyle you know mm-hmm. um, i was doing things that no other kid my age would have been able to do yeah. um, also we kind of idolize these people in the public eye we look at them and we think you know mm-hmm. they're they're the perfect body shape they have the perfect lives we do it mm-hmm. with influencers that we see on social media and mm-hmm. kind of being and being in that role where people were idolizing me or looking up to me i mm. want to be more transparent about what it actually what you're actually seeing online um yeah. sort of behind the scenes in terms of what they do to you or your photos mm. it gets to the, the finished product but actually yeah. where i was in my own mental capacity and the challenges mm. that i yeah i think that's really brave and i think it's a good point as well is that you're just sort of seeing um it almost seemed like a version of someone in some cases rather than their authentic self and that can be quite difficult for people to yeah I, I always liken social media and what we see in the media you know we're the creators of our own content mm. we're almost creating 
our God complex, I say. Mm. You know, we're creating the version of ourselves that we want, that we idealize. And yeah. we can go on our, I can go on my Instagram and I can think, well, my life's been so great because I've only put all of the amazing stuff that I've done. Yeah. On, and that can reassure me. Um, mm. So I think kind of lifting off that lid and saying, actually, okay, you see this, mm. here's the voice behind it, here's the stories behind it. Um, yeah. And this is this is the truth and the reality. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so what are some of the key challenges that you're seeing within men's health at the moment? Um, I think there's always going to be the challenges around uh, stigma. Mm. Uh, I think when it definitely comes to men's mental health and more so when we talk around body image, um, yeah. there is a stigma attached to that. I think, you know, doing the work that I do and the talks that I do around body image in corporate organizations and schools and universities, mm. um, it's it's a topic that hasn't really been approached as much as perhaps some other areas of men's mental health. Um, so there is still the silence, that taboo, mm -hmm. stigma around it, um, that it is potentially sort of a female-led issue. I think mm. you know, that's it that we hear in society is when we talk around body positivity. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing that we get to talk about it, but it's naturally attributed to women. Mm. Um, we don't necessarily talk about it around men. But yeah. when you start to look at you know research that we've been doing and when you're speaking mm. to people, actually men are just as likely to have body image issues as women. Uh, yeah. You know, I see it in day-to-day -day conversation and it, it might kind of visage itself in a, in a different way because mm -hmm. you're down the pub or you're with friends and, you know, some guys, they'll, they'll kind of play it off as banter to say like, you mm -hmm. know, you're short or, you know, you're going bold. Mm -hmm. uh, that is body image issues in itself. Those types yeah. of things men can be very self-conscious about it. You know, mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of rise in terms of, uh, you know, I think there was one brand who brought out uh, insoles, but they can make you look taller. They'll make you look taller. Oh, gosh. That you put yeah. in your shoes. And they're like, mm -hmm. they're like making a killing in terms mm -hmm. of revenue, which just goes to show the, why people are buying them. You know, yeah. why are people buying them? Oh, it's because mm -hmm. they want to, look taller so why do they want to look taller oh mm. because actually maybe deep down they are self-conscious about being short because actually yeah. you know there is this narrative that women like a tall dark and handsome guy you know and mm -hmm. i think over the ages we've kind of laughed about it and joked about it mm -hmm. um but and it's probably not taken in the same way as if you were to say something about a woman um, yeah so you know it's kind of just showing you there is this need um mm -hmm. more campaigning and awareness around body image within men i think yeah. you know the other challenges for men's mental health is is action and you know, there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of great organizations who are taking action there's a great load of support networks you have talk clubs um but i think where we want to get to in the corporate space is trying to trying to move from awareness to action um yeah. and it's it's all amazing work that we do on sort of these cultural event days to, mm -hmm. to write social media posts to send out communications but actually we now need to think what is the next step if we can yeah. put this message out we can tell people to start opening up but actually how can we start to facilitate those types of conversations how can we start mm -hmm. to create impact in our own space yeah no absolutely that makes sense because it's it's all well and good understanding it but yeah where do we go from there yeah, you know, and it's not a bad thing to, no. you know, to have the understanding or to create the awareness. It's just mm. now, okay, we've done this. Where do we go from here now? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you recently released a report with the Global Quality Collective, which was brilliant, by the way. And there was a lot oh, of kind of facts and data in there about men's body image and different perceptions and things. So could you talk a little bit about some of the findings in there? Because I think that'd be really useful for our listeners. Yeah, it was a it was a, a report that you know myself and Nicole at the Global Equality Collective mm. have been working on for sort of the past year. Um, mm. Really extensive research that we 
went out to over 1,100 young people between the ages of 12 and 30 years old globally. Mm. Um, just to ask them questions around body image. How do you see yourself? You know, what are the pressures that you face within your country? And mm. we had an overwhelming response from people. Yeah. You know, people from 63 countries, um, all different ages, all different mm. nationalities, genders, races, um, all responded. And the research was, you know, it was great research. Uh, it was very heartbreaking at times to just mm. see why people thought about themselves yeah. the way they did and how they saw themselves. And actually the correlations that you can make goes back to my beginning point is that mm. body image is not, it shows no bias. You know, it is not a yeah. female driven issue. Um, it is not a, I don't know, an 18 year old mm. driven issue. Actually, everybody that we surveyed had body image issues. Some had come out the mm. other end. Um, and that may have been because of age. Some are still going through it. Mm -hmm. Actually, the pressures that we noticed were mm -hmm. a lot around celebrity, a lot around social media, um, yeah. a lot around the imagery that we see. So mm -hmm. the, that's the type of data that in, you know gives us waiting behind what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. It just helps educate schools, universities, employers on why it's so important to start yeah. looking at, you know, the stuff that you're doing in terms of how do you create awareness? How do you create impact and action around body image issues? I think the stats show mm -hmm. something like, you know, of the over a thousand people that we surveyed, I think it was like 90% of people did not feel positive about their body image issue, yeah. their body image, which is a huge yeah. number. Yeah. And, and so sad you know and we had yeah. comments from people saying you know they people as young as like 14 saying that they yeah. were considering cosmetic surgery or that they had yeah. suicidal which is so heartbreaking so yeah. it's not only to educate employers on how they can prepare and support young people actually it's also mm -hmm. how they can support and prepare parents as well and yes. how they can yeah. facilitate those conversations um, mm -hmm. with their own children um so yeah no it was it was really great research and we've got a mm. positive response from it and you know we've really got a lot of organizations on board with wanting to to make a change and i think in the corporate okay. space we have because i think you know when we took a look at this and you know organizations they'll come and be like well what can we actually do about it mm. and there are things that you can do about it you know it's great as i said that you have you know, the awareness days in the calendar where you can get guest speakers in, you can sign mm. those people to different charities and mental health organizations. But actually, when it you talk around body image, um, mm. there's, a, there's a lot more that you can do. Um, mm. You know, you can review your marketing materials. Yeah. Um, you know, is everybody on the poster? Are they all of, you know, a size zero? Um, mm. Actually, how does that affect somebody's body image when they take a look yeah. at um, the events that you have? You know, is mm. it a pizza every Friday or, you know, if you're having a pizza every Friday, how does that affect somebody who has a body image issue or an eating disorder? So it's all mm. of those small different things that you can make, which really mm. make a difference. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Um, those kind of like day in, day out things, because, yeah, the events are great, but it's it's just like a kind of a drop in the bucket, isn't it, compared to the kind of that game, that culture in the workplace. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, within the report, you said there were 63 countries, which is amazing. So obviously you've got some really good global kind of data. Um, did you find there was much difference between different countries of in whether people were happy with their body image, like stereotyping? What, what kind of things did you see or, or not see? Yeah, do you know what? It was really interesting, Kat, because, and I guess this was the whole point of doing the survey, because this, mm. this is what we wanted to highlight, was that the definition of beauty mm. is not universal. Um, you know, and I think, you know, us sitting in the UK or in the Western world will think, to us, beauty probably means, or what society deems beauty mm. as, is, you know, somebody somebody who potentially looks like you know kim kardashian or mm -hmm. 
Chris Hemsworth. Um, yeah. And, you know, not that not that there's anything wrong with wanting to look like that. I'm just picking that out because mm. they're the first names that come to my head when we, yeah. when we talk around what are, what's men's beauty and women's beauty. Um, but actually, when we had a lot of responses from people who lived in Asia, um, mm. their idea of beauty was not those that type of standard. Yeah. It wasn't those types of people. They, you know, in the Western world, we want to be tanned. In Asian countries, they want to be more pale. Mm. Um, you know, we had responses in Africa. You know, the beauty to them was the bigger that you were and like the fatter yeah. you were. Um, mm. Responses in India where beauty was determined by not how you looked, but by the clothes and jewelry that you wore. Mm. Um, in South America, we had a lot of people talk around beauty was around, you know, plastic surgery and cosmetic surgery. Mm. Um, so it, yeah. I guess it did unveil what I hoped it would unveil mm. was that actually beauty standard is not one thing. It, yeah, it's not I mean, clearly actually, if it's so different in, yeah, <laughs> in exactly. every country, you know. <laughs> well, actually anybody who mm. sat there feeling very insecure about them, it probably won't mean a lot when I say it, but actually, mm. you know, you are beautiful the way that you are. You you're enough because mm. you know society does not look at you and think you know you're anything less because actually the definitions of what that is varies from country yeah. to country, yeah. from individual to individual. So you know mm. that's kind of what I wanted to unveil and, and showcase mm. to the world, and, and it it did come through in the research that we did. Yeah, and I think people are probably a lot better at seeing beauty in others than in themselves as well, because I think we're often a lot harsher on ourselves with, with anything like that when it comes to comparison. Oh, definitely. Um, I'm, the, I'm the worst. I'm the worst for comparing myself. Mm. Yeah, me too. I did a presentation <laughs> on imposter syndrome recently, and one of the big areas that we were talking about was comparison. And yeah, how? I think it's that it's always a funny. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, even now that we've moved into this virtual way of of meetings, you know, I mm. can see myself on the screen and I keep yeah. thinking, oh, my God, I hate I hate looking at myself. And, you know, it's it's always funny when you join like a Teams meeting and somebody mm. goes to share their screen and they have the the Teams thing of everybody up and you can see yourself on the camera. Yeah. Uh, and everyone's like, get me off. T stop sharing. Yeah. <laughs> Hide themselves. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so true. Um. So when it's coming kind of back to the um, corporations, you mentioned before when we were planning to have this talk that you feel organisation, branding and culture need to be kind of linked and not siloed. Could you talk a bit more about that? Yeah, it's uh, it's something that I've been trying to, you know, I've been giving it a lot of thought and I've been trying mm -hmm. to pitch to companies around a different way of thinking. You know, when we talk around organisational design or structure, we usually put together, we'll have people and culture, and within that mm. it's all around sort of the DNI and you yeah. know, the, the HR and the well-being. And then we'll silo to that, or you know, perhaps mm. in another office, in another building, we have brand and marketing. Mm. Um, but actually, what I want to do and what I'm trying to educate people on is actually we should be bringing our brand and our culture together. And mm necessarily in terms of they should report into each other but there should be a mm. very strong dotted line between them because yeah. what i see when i do a lot of consultancy work or we go in and we'll work with companies is actually you know we want to improve their well-being and when we do employee surveys or focus groups is mm. externally we'll see companies they'll be they'll have great pr around they're very inclusive their culture is mm. great they have great well-being initiatives, but when we do the focus groups, um, mm. the story is very different. So yeah. it's actually kind of a um, like a gap that mm. um, because what is being shown externally is not reflected internally, and actually, yeah. what happens then is then the reputation of that organization starts to become broken. You know, mm. trust lost um things feel very false so what we try to do is we try to say actually your brand and culture teams need to work much more closely aligned together because mm -hmm. your brand equals your culture and your culture should yeah. equal your brand if you build your culture up 
and you create a very positive, inclusive culture where people feel valued and they feel happy and mm. they feel satisfied, they will naturally build your brand for you. They, mm. they, will, they will support building your brand because they'll be able to go and tell they'll tell their friends, they'll tell mm. their peers, they'll tell their networks, they'll yeah. talk about it on social media, they'll use LinkedIn to say, you know, love my mm. day in the office today, this is what we did. Mm. That builds your brand for you. Mm. Uh, and then on the flip side of that, I've I've gone into many companies where I don't really know much about their brand or what they represent. I've gone mm. in and you know, amazing cultures. And I mm. say you need to be building this into your brand. You know, yeah. you need to be shouting about this because mm. you can get those two things together in symmetry you become a much more powerful player in the industry because mm. not only will you, will you retain the best of your talent, um, mm. you're also going to attract new talent. People want yeah. to work for companies that have great brand values, that have great cultures where they feel valued. Um, mm. And that can only work if those two things are in line with each other because the minute yeah. that they're not, that's when it becomes inauthentic. People can see mm. through that. And that is when your reputation um starts to kind of be damaged yeah that authenticity is really important and something yeah important. so it's it's yeah. it's kind of thinking you know let's not just focus on what are the marketing and brand team doing to push out all this messaging and what mm. are we doing internally to fix this actually we need to team up because mm. those two things they run in parallel they run yeah. together um because if they're out of sync then mm -hmm everything becomes inauthentic, like you said, and authenticity mm -hmm. um, is so key in today's age. Yeah. Do you think this is something that's kind of become more noticeable since COVID? Do you think people are kind of more aware of, I don't know, just kind of really more interested and invested in whether the company meets their values or that there is a culture they want to be in? I think so. I, I, I definitely think so in more recent years and, and whether mm -hmm. that's COVID and sort of now we're moving into a different way of working. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I you know I do a lot of studies um, and work with sort of Gen Z. Uh, mm, that's true. Obviously, you have different generations. And yeah, yeah. Too. <laughs> they're coming up. You know, from mm -hmm. education, they're coming out into the working world. Yeah. And actually, what do they want from a company? Mm -hmm. They mean they don't have the excuse to say. Oh, this is how it was before COVID. That's true. But actually, they can come up and they can form what is it that we want from a company. Mm. And rather than them have to adapt to a company's way of style, it's actually the other way around. Because mm. if organizations aren't flexing, um, then you They're won't get hire them. the <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Um, mm. It's a no-brainer. So mm. I think it does become, now that we live in a more remote world and a lot of mm. companies are able to hire remotely and virtually rather than yeah. within a, a physical geographical location um, it has become a much more candidate driven market so mm. candidates can now pick organizations that align to their values and mm. again going back to the whole brand equals culture culture equals brand is that if they see a job ad for a company which their brand looks really great they mm. you know they're advertising a great positive brand and then they go work in there mm. and, and they notice that the culture is just really toxic mm. um you know not only will they leave but actually that brand has been damaged for them and mm. in today's age of social media i'll share about it <laughs> exactly, I'll share about yeah. it and there's you know there's there's no going back from that you have to mm. it takes time to repair that so yeah yeah no you're right i think um you know, it's it's really important for organizations to get on board with that and, um, mm. you know, just understand that everything has to be aligned, everything has to be authentic. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so what are some key ways that organizations can better support men's health? I think, um, so putting in really robust wellbeing initiatives is the mm. first one. I think making sure that you have support networks. So any company that you know, doesn't at the moment have a well-being committee or a mental health network um, or support group. Um, that's where I would start um, mm. and make it make it for the people, by the people, as mm. the expression goes. You know, have volunteers 
who yeah. are willing to invest their time and their mm. passion to be able to lead that. Um, it's always great when you can build up a more peer support group uh, yeah. where other people can join rather than something coming in uh, and feeling like it's come from a senior leader and being told mm. what to do. It's always great when you can empower other people to start these types of groups. Um, yeah speaking around what sort of you know senior leaders and execs can do i think share their own stories it's always mm -hmm. great to break down those barriers that separate you um so if you can see people sharing their stories around their own challenges and actually you know they still manage to get to where they are and in their job role and that hasn't hindered them that can be very inspiring um to mm. your career. so yeah. sharing stories is great uh Recognizing those days, you know, I, I know sometimes it can come across as token gestures, um, mm. but actually recognizing things such as International Men's Day, Movember, Men's Health Week, you know, all of those things where you can really just raise and spread the message and mm. showcase your own employees that you are there for them, you do support mm. them. Again, it comes back to the whole build your culture first before you build mm. your brand you know, actually focus on what is the communications that you're going to send out internally before yeah. you write your social media posts for everyone externally to see, mm -hmm. um, you know, make it feel very authentic. Uh, guest speakers in is always a great one. Comes back to that, mm -hmm. sharing stories. Always get people in who can share their stories. You know, you can get as many guest speakers in as, as you want. Um, they're mm -hmm. all going to be different people. When I go in and do yeah. workshops and talks with organizations, I go in knowing that I won't inspire every single person in that room. There will be people mm. in that room who will switch off. Um, they won't mm. be interested because they can't relate to me. They might mm. relate to the next person, but actually yeah. there's gonna be people in that room who will relate to me. Um, mm. So it's, it's getting in loads of different stories as possible. So those are just some quick starters that organizations yeah. can do. No, that's brilliant. I think those are really great places for everyone to get started really. Um, that's fantastic. Um, so if our listeners do want to get in touch with you and learn more about you and what you do, or maybe, you know, consider having you come in um, to their workplaces, what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Uh, all the social medias. So uh, I think I'm on every social media platform. <laughs> <that> you, <laughs> have, but, you know, connect with me on LinkedIn, drop me a message, um, go to the website, tommyhatto.com, drop me an email team at tommyhatto.com um one of the team will be able to pick up and uh yeah we're, you know we're here to support all i want to do is help empower people to be the best version of themselves i want to be able to you know create cultures where people feel valued they feel supported um so yeah any advice or support or, or talks that i can give then yeah please do reach out to me oh thank you tommy it's brilliant having you on i really enjoyed talking with you today oh no cheers Kat. thank you so much Thank you. Oh, and well done again on the report. It was some really great research. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no, head to <laughs> head to the website if you want to download the report. Um, it really is interesting um, just to get all of the different perspectives um, on, you know, different countries and that and, you know, how people see education and the workplace mm -hmm. as well. So, yeah, it was it was a fun one to do. Yeah, could be nice to share um, even within workplaces to start conversations about some of these things and yeah, maybe start opening some of those doors. Yeah, totally. <laughs>